to have an audience of people who know you, who trust you, who buy your products and services. Sounds easy enough, but building an audience can sometimes feel pretty overwhelming. So today we're really going to dive into some archetypes around audience attraction. Linda Claire Puig is here to share what she knows about these six archetypes. And I'm really excited for this because Linda, this is so interesting how you position this, right? I think for, for me and for a lot of um, our viewers and listeners, the idea of having archetypes can be really exciting because we can start to paint a picture of, of what to do. So let's dive yeah. into why, why archetypes? Why do you, why do you share your knowledge in this, in this format? <laughs> To, to be honest, I'd always wanted to create an archetype world, you know, and um, and I just never knew when it was going to present itself to do that. And uh, I, I've been teaching about aud audience attraction and um, nurturing and conversion and whatnot for many, many years. And all of a sudden, earlier this year, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do my my archetype thing with audience attraction, because I know that there are plenty of people who are like really anti-social media. I'm, I'm one of them. And then there are others who are really into social media. So I started looking at the different personalities of people and, and how they operate in the world, how they operate in their business. And it really, it was so interesting. It fell into a very clear pattern of six archetypes that, you know, they overlap. You can have one and you can have a primary one and a secondary one. Like, you know, it's not it's not like the, your one thing and one thing only, but it was really fascinating how you could sort of dial in what to focus on based on your archetype. So yeah, I love it. I felt I it. like it was a way to um, one of the biggest problems that my students have is they feel this sense of overwhelm around uh, audience attraction because there are so many different things to do and you're supposed to do all of them you're supposed to do facebook and instagram and and pinterest and youtube and you know like all these things that you're supposed to do and so finding a way to sort of manage what you might focus your attention on was uh, of interest to me and of interest to my students I want to, before we dive into the archetypes, which we, which we will, I want to get your opinion on the state of the union and as far as audience attraction is concerned today for social media is I have my own opinions, but I want to explore that with you and get your professional insight as well. Things are changing. I mean, things are changing radically and it seems like they're changing pretty fast. So what do we need to know about audience attraction as far as it pertains to social media for today? Well, I'm of the opinion, so first of all, there are really two basic ways to attract an audience, to find them and pull them into your world. And one is social media, obviously, and that has its many parameters. And then the other is other people's networks. And that would be things, things like online events, um, uh, JV swaps, you know, working with JV partners, getting in front of other people's communities, even guest blogging would qualify as that. So understanding that there are these two sort of, um, you know, mutually beneficial, but potentially separate, completely separate ways of attracting your audience. Um, the reason that I personally gear myself toward other people's networks is I find it and have found it over the years to be significantly more effective, just in terms of the number of opt-ins, in terms of the warmth of the audience, in terms, you know, when, when they meet you, it's because it's by recommendation of somebody that they already know and trust. And so that's why I like to use primarily other people's networks to, to do my audience building. Um, social media is great for a lot of things um, and it can be great for audience attraction. There are several really clear strategies that work well for the right person. But overall, I would say that you're gonna have a lot more results for your efforts when you're in front of other people's networks. What's interesting is how we connected. We connected through the network side of things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and to your point, things are changed, changing quite a bit on social media. And it's not to say that some people don't still have success. Those are viable oh, distribution channels. There are still billions yeah. of people on them, et cetera. But certainly I believe that if you have high ticket products and services to sell, you're probably more likely to have success on the on the networking side. But there's still, I think, a place to be visible online on social media and still 
leverage those opportunities of distribution as much as you can. So, well, and, um, and you know, Cheryl, the main thing is regardless of whether you are primarily using social media or primarily other people's networks or a combination of both, the main thing is, is that your focus is on getting people to your list and then spending your time nurturing that audience because that's yours. And a lot of people think that, you know, all their social media followers are theirs. They're not actually, your account could be closed down any, any day right. just for, by accident, just by mistake. So I have a, I have really a client important. Who, I have a client who that happened to, Yeah, you know, that, that Instagram too. account. And one day it just disappeared. And then yep. we together tried to, con, you know, to f try and find a human being to yeah. request right. that the, the, the account come back. Exactly. And then, it still hasn't happened. And they think you know, he's in his forties and they think he's 13 years old and, and oh. you can't argue with them. <laughs> so oh, that's it, really sad. <laughs> yeah, it is sad, but, um, but it just goes to show that, you know, you don't really, you're renting, you know, you're renting yeah. over on those social you platforms. Are. But again, I don't want to discount that those are still viable distribution channels. Oh, I don't just, either. I don't, I don't mean to it knowing that. that. Just know I that. Totally going agree into. with you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's dive into the archetypes. This is exciting because regardless of whether you're using social media or you're using the networking and the JB kind of side of things, these archetypes will help you to attract your audience. So let's dive into archetype number one. Yeah. Well, first I just want to say you usually are going to have one dominant one. You might have a secondary one uh, and it's not a straight jacket, right? Just because you find yourself um, as one of the six doesn't mean that you can only do the things that apply to that archetype, right? You get to choose. You're always a choice. Um, and and it, it's especially important if your one archetype and your audience is completely different, right? You're going to need to find a, a good middle ground there. So, um, and then lean into your archetypal qualities, even if you are, um, for example, if you're somebody who We'll, we'll go through them. I'll tell you in a second. But like if, if LinkedIn is your thing because of your archetype and you don't really like LinkedIn, but you need to use it because that's where your people are, then you can always lean into your archetype to present yourself in the way that your archetype does on the platform that you have to be on just because that's where all your people are. So just okay. wanted to make a couple of points there before I start. So the first one is the journalist. So this is a person who is... Um, curious about, you know, they're curious about um, everything, you know, they, they, writing is their strength, they are, um, they're natural interviewers, and they do pretty good at being interviewed themselves. Um, they prefer, generally speaking, staying out of the big spotlight. Um, so we want to understand that the journalist is probably going to be doing things like podcasts, right? Um, where they can interview people or be interviewed. They're going to be writing longer things on Facebook, for example. They're going to be doing books. Books are a great list building activity. And a journalist is a natural at that. Um, they would probably focus on guest blogging or summits like the one that I'm that I'm starting next next week. Um, so the, that's you know, it, it, it helps them lean into their natural curiosity and their natural talents. Um, the next one is the artist. The artist is my son. My son is a photographer. And, you know, you don't have to actually be an artist to be the artist archetype, but they are really just naturally creative. They're drawn to art. They're drawn to design. They're drawn to um, illustrating things with beautiful photography so you can lean into your artist archetype, even when you're doing other things, if that's you. If you're not the artist, like you could put up a sales page with no photos and you'd be fine with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, well, I, I mean, I definitely, I definitely lean, you know, so far, obviously, to, to the, the journalist part yeah. is what I did professionally for years. Um, but Oh, you were a journalist yeah. professionally? Oh, that's right. You were. Yes, I, I was. Too. I was a journalist professionally for 25 years. So I oh definitely can relate to, as you were describing it, I'm like, she's talking yeah. about me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I love it. And I'm sure that our viewers and our listeners can start, will we'll relate to at least probably one of these archetypes. So what's number yeah, three? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I predict that you will. And I was a journalist too. So it was no surprise for me either. That that's what I qualified as. Um, <laughs> So uh, the artist is going to do things like um, Pinterest. They love Pinterest because it's just so visual. They love Instagram, especially. 
They love YouTube. Um, they can express and share their artistic vision. And, you know, when they're, when they're doing online events, such as let's say giveaways, you know, they're going to be the ones that have just really eye catching, eye popping kinds of web design. Um, the, uh, there's a few really interesting people that I love to follow. There's an, a guy who actually is an artist and he had, um, he started a YouTube channel after years and years of doing retreats in France and the lavender fields of France. Um, he started a YouTube channel and he got so many followers from that effort. And then he launched some courses and he sold like more than 800 courses. It was just amazing what he was able to do with YouTube. Um, my son uses Instagram only. That's his preferred way of, of, of getting audience. So um, the next one is the host. The host, you can imagine people who like to gather people together, start conversations, right? Um, make sure everybody is doing well. <laughs> so the host um, is somebody who would really love you know, Clubhouse is not that, uh, not as big as it was back in 2020, but there are still people using it quite successfully. And so Clubhouse is a perfect place for the host, for a host. Um, some of the Twitter, um, I don't know about Twitter right now, but <laughs> in general, like the Twitter listening spaces, those also are good hosting platforms. Podcasts are great for, for hosts, obviously on the hosting end. Um, and they can host summits and host giveaways. And, you know, they just, they have that presence of gathering people together for this big thing that's going to happen. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, the, I think about the social audio side of things and yeah. and then also community and, and maybe bringing people together in a group and things of that nature. It sounds yeah, interesting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the organizer, they love to create groups. They love to organize ideas. They're really naturally good at things. Uh, keeping things in order. There is a, a colleague of mine and friend who's been on some of my uh, adventurous life trips who is just like you look at her Pinterest page and it is so pristinely organized and colorized and it's just an amazing thing to look at. And then if you look at all of the rest of her, uh, of her, you know, digital footprint, you can tell she's the organizer because of the way that she you know, puts things together in little groups and makes sure that things look nice and neat over here. And, um, and, and it's not just about visual, it's, it's also about groups, you know, like somebody who in Facebook has all of their Facebook friends divided into very, very uh, minutely <laughs> detailed groups of people so that they can um, message them individually or not individually, but, you know, as a group. Yeah. Is, um, is organizer the fourth archetype? Yes. It is. Okay. Before I put it on the screen, <laughs> I yeah. want to make sure I had it right. Yeah. Yeah. Organizer is a fourth. Um, the fifth is the connector. The connectors, they love connecting. They love matchmaking. They love uh, joint venture partnerships, right? It's all relationship, relationship, collaboration, collaboration. And they're the ones that love reaching out to people. You know, there, there are some in the archetypal world that are like, don't make me ask to you know, at, talk to people and, and make them ask uh, or ask them things, right? Just, just don't make me do it. I can't do it. The connector loves that kind of stuff. And they will not only, you know, connect people um, for other purposes, you know, for their own purposes, they'll also do it for other purposes, you know, so they'll be like, oh, you should meet so-and-so and they'll connect this person as JV partners. So they're just really collaborative and they love, love, love that that aspect of uh, connecting with other influencers, you know, that sort of a thing. And then the last one is the talent. The talent might be the, the most obvious one. The talent is the one that loves to shine in the spotlight and um, they are very natural on camera. They you know, like pop, a, pop open the camera and just do a, do a video right then and there. They don't need a script. They don't need like, they're just so natural in front of it. They really do gravitate toward video and interviews um, especially YouTube. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I forgot to say that the connectors are um, obviously LinkedIn is a very big yeah. hub for connectors. Um, and Facebook is too. 
Um, as far as the talent goes, you've definitely got like YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and Facebook Lives, like all of the things that have a video component. Brilliant for the talent. This is so interesting because as you're describing these six different audience attraction archetypes, I can relate to some of some aspects of, of multiple of them. Uh -huh. yeah. And I think what would be fun, Linda, would be to encourage our audience, especially for those who are watching the video version of this episode today with Linda, is to go into the comments and put in what you think you are. It might be a one or maybe multiple of these archetypes, but pop them into the comments. I'd be really curious to see what the majority of, of people are, you know, because I can relate to, you know, certainly the talent part of it. You know, mm -hmm. I like being uh, in the spotlight and did that professionally for years. But then mm -hmm. there's part of me that's journalist. And then I think also a little bit of connector and host, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. I can see definitely different yeah. aspects of these archetypes playing into how I see myself. Yeah, some people are lucky and they have a lot of them and others have just one and maybe two. Like I have, I'm the journalist primarily and I've got the artist as a secondary and a distant third, the host, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's absolutely. about it. Uh, you wouldn't find me anywhere near the talent. Um. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I love this. Well, uh, so let's say, you know, we, we, we understand these archetypes and thank you for bringing that to us today. I think it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Once we know what we are, or we can identify a little bit of, of a couple of them or a few of them. What do we do with this information? How can we apply those learnings or that observation of ourselves so that we can attract our audience? Well, I think one of the main things to do is to first know uh, what your preferences are, right? Before you start saying, where should I be? Where do I want to be? Like, I don't want to be on YouTube. I just don't. And so I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to even try to have a YouTube strategy. It's just not me. So it helps you narrow down. So once you've narrowed down to, you know, where you can, you can discover some of the places that you are willing to play, um, then, then, then that's what you focus on. And I recommend that people focus on maximum three, preferably two, and even fine one, of the of the main bulky audience attraction strategies. So for example, myself, I only focus on other people's networks. Like I've just let that whole social media part go. Other people are going to be like, I'm going to be on Instagram and I'm going to do giveaways. And that's what I'm going to do. And you know, as your business grows, you can start focusing on more and more. As your team grows, you can start focusing on more and more. Um, you know, and, I, I if even I had team members who were doing my social media for me. And I, I just, I always discovered that I was the bottleneck. It's like, can you approve these, um, these things? Well, yeah, I'll do it in a week. Right. <laughs> so, so that's how I came to the decision to just stop doing that altogether. But for other people, you know, all you need is that team to, to assist you in, in the growth. You will hear people saying you have to have a presence everywhere. Like you have to at least have a presence and that may or may not be true. Um, I think that it's, it's fine to have just a presence and not really activate it. Um, but you have to be focused on the ones that are working for you. I think I used to subscribe to the idea of that you have to have a presence everywhere. But I think that my thought process around that was pre pandemic. <laughs> You know, and, and I think now, and this is, this is the case with online mm -hmm. business building, social media, you know, entrepreneurship and all that is that things change. Yeah. And so I'm not, I don't think I'm quite as much of the belief today as I was a few years ago about really needing to be on every platform mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. visible. I think it's more important to, to your point. Um, and what you specialize in really is a, a, what is your strategy to make this work for your business? Yeah. Because listen, there's a difference between being on social media for fun and being on social media for business. It's very right. different. A huge need difference. To be a strategy that drives yeah. what you're doing and what the intent is of it all. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that's totally where things are going. I mean, I believe that it's really going to be predicated on community access, your network, who do you know in your database, who can you rely on? I think it's going to be about, to your point, your decision to go down more the, the joint venture relationship kind of side of things mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's how we met. And yeah. it's just making decisions about where you want to be spending your time, energy, and, and possibly investment, right? So yeah. Linda, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing. I know you have the Blowing Up Summit. Tell us about that. I'm going to show it on the screen. Just, just give us the an idea of what it is that you're working on right now. Well, first of all, just um, note how perfect it is for my journalist archetype and my distant third host, right? I'm hosting 40 different speakers, 40 plus speakers. I think we actually have a few more than 40. Um, and so I'm hosting them and I'm interviewing all of them. I got the privilege of interviewing all those speakers, which was just like my joy and these are speakers that are each speaking on the one strategy that helped their business blow up, that, hence the word blowing up summit. Um, and so my co-host is Ari Eni. He's with the Miracy um, Aces Business Acceleration Program. He's the head of strategy there. And the two of us just really do deep dives into these different strategies that, that each of the individual speakers have experienced themselves and are able to teach on. So it's really, really, I'm super excited about it. I've been working so hard on it. It's beautiful and uh, practical and uh, very exciting, I think, for the people who will be hearing all of the different speakers. Yeah. I, I definitely recognize names. I've worked with some of the names on this uh, website, and I know mm -hmm. some of these names, and I know that this is going to be an amazing, uh, a lot of these speakers I've heard on stages in the last decade, I've you know, coach with some, like, it's, it's really amazing what yeah. you brought together here. So I yeah. just want to congratulate you on that. And I'm going to leave a link below this episode of where you can participate and where you can register for the awesome. blowing up summit. Awesome. Um, I love what you've done. I like the work that you do. I'm really impressed with not only this, but just your philosophy around, and especially in this episode, this idea that you don't have to do everything, yeah. pick some places to be, yeah. understand what your strategy is. And I know that that is going to be a big part of the blowing up summit is really helping bring all of that together so that everything starts to make sense. So coming back full circle to where we started this episode, which is this idea of being overwhelmed and confused and all of that, you get to a place where things start really making sense because you're yeah. making smart decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Linda, one last thing. We yeah. have a little thing here called Stop Marketing Like It's 1999. It's my ode <laughs> to Prince since I'm a huge fan. What is a tip, a tool, a tactic, or a technique that's really helping you to market yourself and your company today? Well, at the risk of repeating myself a little bit, first of all, I'm going to say I'm going to, I'm not, I don't market like it's 1999, but I do market like it's maybe 2005. Okay, I, I, still, like I still think that there are lots of really super valuable basics, foundational ways of marketing yourself that are tried and true. And for me, it's the email list. So I am all about getting the email list and then nurturing them, like developing a real authentic relationship. I love writing my audience about my travels and drawing stories from those and lessons from those. Like, I just feel like the act of building an email list and then developing that relationship with it is what leads to converting them into students and clients and sales of all sorts. So Love that. Market like it's 2005. Market like it's 2005. <laughs> I know you asked for modern, but it's still working. That's okay. You know what? It's more, what's more important is what's working. And I think that it is really going back to the basics. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to basics and look at the fundamental things that you can be doing that are actually going to be working. And so uh, just a reminder again, look for the link below this episode. Um, I will put it in there for the Blowing Up Summit. You are going to want to claim your free ticket, absolutely, and listen to these 40 amazing entrepreneurs who reveal the details of their number one strategy to explosive success. Linda, Claire, Puig, thank you so much for being on Cashing on Camera thank today. Thank you, too. Oh, it's been a, such a 